Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Pray the Lord blesses you for having been here and pray that he keeps you in good health during this pandemic and uh, pray that you're getting used to wearing masks. It's funny. Uh, the only people who used to wear masks were criminals. Now the only people who wear, who don't wear masks, I think, are criminals because nobody re will remember their face without their mask. Anyway, it's kind of funny. Uh, glad you're here. Pray the Lord blesses you and uh, pray that we can learn something together as we uh, start in the book of Acts, chapter 21 and verse 27 is where we're at. This is the Macro Church of Christ Sunday Acts study. And uh, we're glad you hear all the information is there on the screen. Uh, if you need anything, please feel free to, to call or let us know. We'll be happy to help in any way we can. <clears throat> well, looking at Paul, and sometimes it's called Paul's fourth uh, missionary journey, although it wasn't really a missionary journey as in the other ones that he took uh, because he he personally uh, went and planned and did everything. But this is a missionary journey that you might say the Lord sent him on uh, as a result of the uh, riot that happens in Jerusalem. And um, he ends up going all the way to Rome. And that's where the, the book of Acts ends up. But so this is what some people call his fourth missionary journey. And so it's been, he's here in Jerusalem right now. Remember, that's where he had the uh, encounter with uh, the individuals who were basically telling him that he needed to uh, purify himself for those people who were taking the, the a vow and pay for their expenses in order to prove that uh, he was also keeping the law. Uh, and so that's where we're at. And as we take a look at that, we're here in, let me get this to the right spot. Remember, this uh, again is. Esword, and by the way, if you don't have Esword, it's free. It's easy to use, and uh, you might get it, and it might be beneficial for you. But that's what I'm using here. Uh, and by the way, they they also have other, um, other I don't know what you call them um, stuff you can buy. They're, they're add-ons that you can buy uh, if you want to purchase things that are that are more recent. Uh, they have those, but I just like it for the text and the um, and the Greek and those things that that help out, I think. So we're here in Acts 21 and verse 27, and we're going to notice that Paul had been purifying himself in verse 26. Remember, the reason for him doing that was because some people were saying that Paul was teaching not just the Gentiles, but the Jewish community, that they were supposed to forsake the law of Moses and that they were supposed to, weren't supposed to keep the law or the traditions. And Paul was teaching that to the Gentiles, he, however, was not teaching that to the Jewish community. And so Paul, in order to show that uh, he himself kept the law and was, matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why he was down in, in Jerusalem. Remember that on his way there, on his third missionary journey, he actually had a vow. And so it, remember, he shaved his head. So that's Old Testament uh, stuff. There's no New Testament place where it says we're supposed to shave our heads and keep a vow uh, and do those kind of things. So Paul was keeping the law, but not... Uh, as as contrary to the law of Christ, he was certainly keeping that, and that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 at the end of the chapter there. He discusses that uh, when he talks about his liberties. But anyway, so he, he was in the temple purifying himself in verse 26. It says, then Paul took the men, and the next day purifying himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice to the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Now, and we know that this took place pretty quickly, because when Paul gives his defense a little bit later on, he says that he would, had only been in Jerusalem for 12 days. So this doesn't happen like over months. This happens like fairly quickly uh, when Paul is doing this. But in verse 27, it says, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place, for they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. 
While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman co co cohort that all Jerusalem was in, in confusion. At once, he took uh, along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. Uh, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And he began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. And when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When he got to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people kept following them, shouting away with him. So we'll stop there for just a second and notice what's going on. So uh, Paul, it's almost on, on it's, it's almost the completion of the men's vows and some people see Paul in, in the temple. And I want you to notice what people see him. And verse 21 says, uh, chapter 21, verse 27 says, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him. Now, when he talks about th those who were from Asia, I want you to remember that Paul spent a great deal of time there, if you remember, in, in Asia. In, um, um, I believe it was Acts chapter 17, uh, when Paul, no, it's Acts chapter 18, I thought. Well, anyway, it's when Paul was in, in Ephesus. And when he was in Ephesus, probably 19, when he was in Ephesus, he uh, was there for three years. And it said all of Asia heard the word. So during that time, no doubt, the Jewish community, who were not sympathetic to the Christians, when they heard about what Paul was doing, they would be against him and contrary to him. And remember that it's also those individuals, just the general demeanor of, of that society, seem to be individuals who would rebel and 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 uh, had kind of a mob mentality uh, that would uh, be inflamed quite easily. And so it says that the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him. So these Asian Jews, it wasn't the, it wasn't the Jerusalem Jews, it was the Asian Jews who probably were familiar with Paul because of his stay there in Ephesus for those three years uh, that he was there. And uh, in verse 28, it says, they cried out, men of Israel, Come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law in this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. <clears throat> and so they, they were stirring up the people. They laid, laid hands on him. And basically, they uh, asked for help. And they said, men of Israel. In other words, uh, when he says men of Israel, he's talking about uh, those people who are local in Israel, as opposed to the Asian Jews that we had over here who started this. That those Asian, Asian Jews basically said to the Israelite Jews, come to our aid and help us. In other words, don't uh, support us and back us in what we're doing. And it says that and the reason for it is that this is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he's even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Now, remember, that's the exact reason that Paul was actually taking this vow was to show that he wasn't somebody who was teaching against the Jews or against the law, but that he himself was keeping the law and was orderly. I remember here when James is talking to him, he says in verse 23 of Acts 21, therefore do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you but that you yourselves also walk orderly, keeping the law. Remember, that's the reason why he went into the temple. That's the reason why he was purifying himself during those seven days that those men were taking that vow. So the, the very accusations they made as soon as they saw Paul were actually fictitious and made up. That It was just something they assumed that Paul, that Paul was, was doing, as other people had assumed it. Paul was not preaching this, but anyway, that's the, that's the charge they, they cried against him in order to rally the Israelite Jews to come to the aid of the Asian Jews as they were stirring up the crowd and laying hands on Paul. Uh, and, so, and, and, and then it says, and besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Now, uh, you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is under Jewish custom, now I want you to understand this is Jewish custom. There's no place in the Old Testament where God makes this rule uh, about who can approach him uh, in 
uh, in worship, except for the idea of the priest who would serve in, in the temple uh, and in the tabernacle. Uh, uh, but the, the Jewish community had decided <clears throat> that they were going to segregate people. <clears throat> and the way they desegregated people was they had the, the, the Holy of Holy, and then they had the, the priests who worked in there, and they're, they're the ones who could get cl the closest. Then the people who could actually be in, in the temple area would be the Jewish community, the men. The Jewish men would be the ones who could then be closest to, to the uh, temple. And then there was a wall, and then the Jewish women could then be next, uh, uh, the next group in that wall. And then there was a, a third wall, and that wall was to keep all Gentiles out. And so the closest the Gentiles could come in would basically be th three walls uh, um, to the temple, uh, which, by the way, none of this was in the Old Testament. Uh, it was passed down by tradition. And some people today believe that it was in the Old Testament, but it wasn't. Uh, there's no place where, where God ever mentioned that because the purpose for the coming of, of Jesus and, and the Messiah was to save everybody. Uh, and if, if Gentile people couldn't be in there, then people like uh, Rahab couldn't, couldn't be in there. People like Hannah couldn't be in there. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, uh, you need to understand that that's, that's what's going on here. Not only that, but uh, history and archaeologists have found a um, plaque with an inscription uh, to the Gentiles that says, enter in uh, at the forfeiture of your own life or something to that effect. Basically, what he's telling the Gentiles is if you pass this area, you pass this wall and proceed into where the Jewish women can be or into where the Jewish men can be or pray tell even into the temple where the, where the altar is, that uh, you're going to be killed. And so that's what they're really screaming about here. And that's why it says uh, that they, they accuse him and says, and besides, uh, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. So first of all, Greek coming into the temple wouldn't defile the place. There's no place in the Old Testament where God says that that would defile the place. Uh, but because of their tradition, because they had done it for so long, it became a law and a rule that, they, that w was enforceable by death, punishment of death. Uh, and so, the, but the reason that they thought that about Paul was because verse 29 says, for they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So they were doing what a lot of people do, and that is they were assuming. They had seen Prophemus, who was an Ephesian, and therefore he wasn't a, a Jew uh, with Paul. And so they supposed that since Paul was in the temple, he must have brought Prophemus in the temple. But Paul wouldn't have done that because he understood their customs and he understood their, their way of looking at things. And he wouldn't do something just to simply get them upset or, or, or to irritate them. Uh, and, and so they assumed that Paul did that. Now, that's what happens with us. We often assume things. Uh, instead of giving people the benefit of the doubt or being certain about the things that are going on. By the way, and we also do this up here where it says, and besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. And you might say, what, 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 what do you mean we do the same thing? Well, by that I mean this became a tradition and it became a tradition enforceable by their religion. And sometimes we believe that uh, we have certain, certain rules or certain laws that we keep and, and we expect everybody to do them. And if they don't do them or they don't follow them, we kind of look at them as if they're not God's people. And therefore we do the same thing. That is we put them to spiritual death, just like they put these people to physical death. Uh, for example, I know some individuals who, who, say, who say that unless you call yourself the Church of Christ, that you, uh, uh, can't be his people and you aren't his people because you don't have the right name, uh, even though you don't find any buildings anywhere in the New Testament that had names on them. Uh, but just simply pointing that out to you, or some individuals believe that you, you have to use one cup or that you have to use a plurality of cups uh, or you have to use a certain colored uh, fruit of the vine in, in order for, for you to be able to uh, be acceptable with God. Uh, and so therefore we need to be careful about these traditions that we do for, uh, for years and years and years, and we just adopt them simply because we become part of a group of individuals. And by the way, and, uh, most churches have things that they do like that. And so we need to be careful that we're not doing those things and that those traditions that we're keeping or those, those rituals that we're keeping 
we're keeping them simply as, as things that remind us of God and not binding them on other people um, when we can't prove it is to be bound on other people. Anyway, so verse 29 says, they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. And so, so again, notice that they had assumed some stuff. So we need to be careful about assuming stuff. God's people are never supposed to assume anything. I'd, say, I'd suggest that's even the reason why when the, Jesus talked about a brother who sinned, that it requires two witnesses. Uh, because the reason it requires two witnesses, even though one person might see him, uh, God wants to make sure that it's done above board upright, and it's not just somebody seeking revenge or vengeance on somebody. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, God's people are supposed to, supposed to know the truth and supposed to uh, live by the truth. We're not to make assumptions about individuals. Uh, but they assumed that. And so, as a result of that, all of the city was in an uproar. Uh, in, in verse 30, it says, Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And so, the, when the city heard about that, they, or, or when the people heard about that, they drove Paul out of the temple and they shut the, the doors so that he couldn't go in. And no doubt it was also in order for them to maybe purify the temple again or to make sure that it, it hadn't been um, defiled uh, in order for them to be able to worship uh, God. And so the, in, the individual shut the door and they dragged Paul off. Now, what I, what I find interesting is that uh, God's um, laws are designed to do two things, love God and love people. And yet you, you see them, uh, you see these supposed God-fearing people doing neither of that. They're making assumptions, which God would not want them to make. And then they're dragging Paul off and convicting him even before they have proof and God wouldn't want that. Uh, and so therefore that kind of shows you uh, why Jesus uh, um, disowned the, the Jewish community and had the temple destroyed in about 40 years uh, by the uh, Romans uh, in order to prove that they were no longer his people. But they shut the door. And verse 31 says, and while they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the, uh, the Roman co cohort that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Now, when it says that they were seeking to kill him, it doesn't mean that they, that they pulled him out and they said, okay, let's figure out, you know, if we're going to, if, if, how we can sentence them and how we can try him. No, that, that's not what was under consideration. When it says they were seeking to kill him, look at what it says down here in verse 35. It says when, when Paul got up to the, uh, when, when he or Paul got to the stairs, he was carried about, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. So when it says over here they were seeking to kill him, it, they weren't seeking some judicial manner in order for him to be executed. They were actually killing him. They were actually hitting him or, or, or kicking him or, or doing whatever it is that, that, that they would do in order to inflict uh, pain and punishment on him. Uh, and again, that shows you the kind of individuals th that they were because the, the, the law never allows individuals to take their own uh, revenge or their own punishment, they're supposed to do it judicially. And so again, it shows you the attitude of the Jewish community and the fact that all the, the people that were there were in support of what was going on. You notice that you don't hear anybody, uh, except the Romans that are going to come, you don't hear any of the Jews screaming or saying, hey, don't do that, or, or he's a good guy. Uh, nobody was. Uh, maybe his friends, but th th they weren't enough to, to, to make a difference or to even report. And so, it says, uh, and so it says in verse 31, while they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman co cohort uh, that all, all Jerusalem um, was in an uproar. I can't remember exactly how much a cohort is. Uh, let me see if, it, if this actually tells us. Uh, I was, can't remember exactly. Oh, it's a thousand men, I believe. Uh, the word chief captain uh, denotes properly uh, one who commands a thousand men. So the that the cohort is probably a thousand men that are in Jerusalem for the purpose of keeping the peace. Now, a thousand men is an awful lot of men, but the reason they were there is because the Jewish people were very rebellious and difficult to deal with. Uh, they, were, they were always creating problems and riots, as you can see here, uh, and, and they, were, they were constantly bickering and fighting. And so no wonder the Romans had to have a cohort uh, of people there in order to promote uh, peace. And that's 
what the Romans were, were trying to do. Uh, I know that later on, the Romans are going to persecute Christians. Uh, but during this time, the, uh, the, the Romans, and even, even during that time, their, their main objective was the purpose of keeping peace and not creating problems. Uh, and so the, the Romans were doing what they're supposed to do. But it says, while they were seeking to, to kill Paul, the Jews, a report came up to the commander of the Roman co cohort that all Jerusalem was, was in confusion. So the, the, uh, it's reported to the commander. And so it says in verse 32, at once he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So there it is. They're, they're actually trying to kill him with their own hands. So the, the, the Jewish sense of law and the Jewish sense of justice uh, isn't there. Um, the, the, they have no, no sense of real justice. They only, use, they only use the courts when it's to their advantage because they can't do it themselves. Uh, be, but, but they just go out and kill people. And that, that's what I want you to notice about them. This is the kind of people that Jesus is saying, they're not my people. And that's the reason they're being condemned. They're not being condemned because they're Jews. They're being condemned because they're these kinds of Jews. Sometimes pe people say that Christians don't like Jews. We love Jews. We, we love Jews. We love uh, uh, Africans. We, we love Mexicans. We love Germans. We love uh, uh, Iranians. We, we, love, we, we love everybody. We're supposed to love everybody. We even love our enemies. But these individuals are, are individuals who aren't living right and aren't doing right and are creating trouble. And that's the reason why God is going to destroy them. And that's the reason why God takes the, the kingdom away from them and gives it to people who will bring him honor, who will love people, who will serve, uh, who will uh, seek the truth and, and try to do it. Uh, and so uh, what you have here is you have the, 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 the Roman cohort and all Jerusalem was in, up, uh, was in confusion. And, and so they called the, the soldiers and the, soldier, uh, uh, the soldiers and centurions came down. Now a centurion is an individual who is a captain of a, a hundred people. So you, so you had you had 10 centurions there because you had a cohort or a thousand men that were there at, at the time. And for some reason, I'm thinking maybe a cohort is 600. But nonetheless, it's a large number of, of soldiers that are there. And it says, and ran down to them. And when they saw, saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beat, beating Paul. So... The only reason they stopped beating Paul is because the authorities had come. Uh, and so therefore they stopped. Now, it's interesting that when you look at, the, at Rome during the life of Paul, especially in this, what they call this fourth journey, which takes him to Rome, that the Romans were always defending Paul and helping Paul with the exception of keeping him in jail. But uh, they, they would certainly try to help him uh, in what they were doing. And so, uh, the Romans uh, weren't against uh, the Jewish community, and they weren't against Christians during this time, but they were there because the, Rome, the, the Jewish community was very difficult to handle. And the, at this time, the Romans considered the Christians as a sect of the Jewish community. And so, they would treat them as they would treat the Jewish community, and that is they would protect them and take care of them uh, and try to, to appease them if they could. But it's interesting that during this time, the, the Romans were actually the individuals who were helping uh, the Christians and the Jewish community, the religious group people that should be serving God, they're the ones that are persecuting uh, God's people, the Christians. Uh, and so it says that at once he took some soldiers and centurions, so he took a couple of men, who had a hundred men under them and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So now you also have to understand that since this is in the temple, this is probably all going on in Hebrew and the people are speaking Hebrew. And um, who knows if the commander knows Hebrew or uh, knows what they're speaking, because it says in verse 33, then the commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains and he began asking who he was and what he had done. And so when the commander came down, he assumed that Paul had done something wrong because the, the Jews were beating him and, you know, 
and were uh, accusing him of, of doing things, but he couldn't, couldn't figure out exactly what it was that he had done, but he bound him with two chains. Uh, and then he tried to figure out what it was that, that uh, they were accusing him of or, or what he had done. Verse 34 says, but among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. And so there's this, there's this crowd and they're, they're, some of them aren't sure what's going on. So some of them are shouting one thing, some are shouting another thing. Probably some are shouting, you know, this is Paul and he's, he's teaching people against our law. And the other ones are probably saying he brought, he brought a, a Gentile in, into, the, into the group. And, and so this, the, the commander didn't know exactly what was going on. Uh, and so he, he didn't quite know. And it says, and when, he had, and when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. So Paul was to be brought into the barracks uh, in, in order to be interrogated. Now, uh, the way they would interrogate somebody the, the way they would interrogate somebody is by flogging them. And so they would flog them and you know if they didn't if they didn't answer properly or if they didn't answer what they thought they should answer, then that they would be flogged and beaten. Uh, and so the commander was getting ready to do that. Uh, and it says in verse 35, and when he got to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. So he had been, uh, such pain and such, such injury had been inflicted on him that he had to be carried by the soldiers uh, because they had mistreated him so poorly. But he, uh, uh, and then in verse 36, it says, for the multitude of people kept following them, shouting away with him. So the multitude is saying, you know, kill him, um, um, execute him, because he, he's worthy of being executed because of what we think he's done. So verse 37 says, as Paul was, brought, was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? The, uh, then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the four thousand men of the uh, assassins out into the wilderness. But Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a city of no, a citizen of no insignificant city, and I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hands, and when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect, saying, so uh, we'll get to his speech in the next chapter in just a minute. But let's look at what go goes on here. So the multitude is saying, away with Paul, crucify him. Or probably that's part of what they were saying, because that's how Romans would kill people. Uh, and so they're saying, away with him. And so it says in verse 37, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? So he, he asked the commander if he could, he could speak to, to the commander. And, and he said, do you know Greek? So apparently Paul talked to the commander in Greek or, or Aramean, and, he, and the, the commander was a little surprised. We find out why he was surprised because of verse 38. It says, then the commander speaking, he says, then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. And so apparently, um, and I believe there's some, historical evidence for this, this uh, Egyptian fella who had led 4,000 men uh, into the wilderness and that rebellion was put down and, and a few of them remained. And so he, uh, the commander was thinking that that's who Paul was, that he was this Egyptian. And that's the reason why that the Jewish community was, was upset with him. And that's what he was thinking. But when he heard Paul talking to him in Greek, uh, he was um, a, a little uh, dumbfounded and, and asked, then, then you're not that Egyptian guy. You, you're not who I thought you were. And so Paul says in verse 39, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia. And so we find a little, we find a little history about Paul here, that he, he was a Jew. In other words, he's, he was born Jew uh, as a Jew. And if you read Philippians chapter 3, it says that he was of the tribe of, uh, of, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, he was an Israelite. Uh, he was somebody who kept the law. He was blameless. But uh, he said, I'm a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. In other words, what he's saying is people from Tarsus are educated. They're educated people. And so therefore, 
it's not surprising that he would be able to speak Greek, which was the common language of the Roman Empire, but not necessarily the local language. See, the local language in, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, would have been Hebrew, but the national language would have been Greek. And a lot of times, a lot of people that are born in an area, they never bother to learn the national language, Greek, uh, because they don't really need it because they live among their own people. And so therefore, they just simply learn, in this case, they would simply learn Hebrew. So when Paul talked to the commander in Greek, he was taken back and, and then was assured that Paul wasn't this Egyptian. Uh, and so Paul pointed out that, yeah, he, he, he knows Greek because he's from Tarsus, and Tarsus is a is not an insignificant city. It's interesting that in the, in the New Testament, when they, want you, when they want to say something is good, they tell you it's not small. When, it, when they want you to think it's big or it, it, it's, not, it's not stupid, when they want you to think it's smart. <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of a, a backwards way from us thinking. Uh, but nonetheless, so when he says a, cit a citizen of no insignificant city means that it, it was a very significant city. And so therefore it would be common or, or customary for Paul to be able to speak Greek. And so he says, I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. So he asked the centurion to allow him to speak. Now, the centurion didn't have to let him do that. Um, the centurion could have just said no, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna figure out what's going on here, uh, and, and could have had him flogged or, or whatever uh, in order for him to, to find it. But like I, like I pointed out before, the Romans, and especially this, the Roman centurions and the commanders, most of them were very uh, honest, upright, and people of integrity, at least when it came to Roman law and, and rules and justice. Uh, they were generally individuals who were looked up to, and that's probably why they became centurions or why they became commanders, because the, 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 the more moral, the, the more uh, honorable the person is, the more likely that uh, he would move up in the ranks uh, in, in, uh, in the Roman Empire. Uh, during this time. Because remember, the, the, the main purpose for a government is to uphold justice and um, to uh, allow people to live a tranquil life. When a government stops doing that, that's when God steps in and removes the government. Um, and, and so he asked him if he could speak, and the centurion gave him permission, verse 40 says. When he'd given him permission, Paul, sta standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hands, and when there was a great hush, he began to speak to them in the Hebrew dialect saying, so I'm sure that one of the reasons there was a great hush is because Paul began to speak to them in the Hebrew dialect. He began to speak to them in the Hebrew. Now, I don't know if the commander knew Hebrew. It doesn't really say where the commander was from. Uh, he might have been from there. But it seems like when you look at the rest of what's going on, that the commander might not have known what Paul was saying, although somebody might have translated it for him a little bit. Uh, but he's, Paul was speaking to the Jews. And so he starts off in chapter 22 and verse 1 and says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense which I now offer to you. And when they had heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet and he said, I am, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being uh, zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them, I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened as I was on my way approaching Damascus, about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and, uh, and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see 
because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand, uh, by the hand, by those who were with me and came into Damascus. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who, who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him and he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance. And, and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I, and I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I also was standing by proving and watching out for the uh, coats of those who were slaying him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Well, that was Paul's little speech that I wanted to read it all to you. But let's get back up here and notice what happens as he, as he begins his speech. Now remember, they had just beaten him, and the, the Roman rulers, the, the Roman commander, had taken him up, and he was standing on the stairs addressing the people. And so he says, brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. So Paul, Paul addresses them as brethren and fathers. Hear my defense, which I offer uh, among you. Now, uh, two things I want you to notice here. First of all, that he calls them brethren. And, and they are brethren. And you might say, but they're, but, some, but they're not Christians. Well, they're Jewish brethren. The, the, the word brethren simply means related to. And so since Paul is a Jew, they are also Jews, and therefore they are related as Jewish individuals. I was playing tennis today with my friends, and, and uh, one of them happens to be African-American, and the other one's white. And, and one of our guys got, got confused at who, who he was serving to. And so the African-American on the other side says, I'm the, I'm the black guy, he's the white guy. And, and I said, yeah, but we're all brothers. And of course, I meant we were all tennis brothers because we're, we're playing tennis. And so that's the way this word brethren is being used here. It's not being used as other Christians, because that you can also use the word brethren uh, to refer to them from a, from a religious standpoint of those who are your brothers religiously. Uh, but he's talking here more from the standpoint of racially, because they're Jews, and he's talking to the Jewish community. Now, I want to mention something about fathers, uh, because Jesus said that we're not supposed to call any man our father on earth. Uh, and so Paul says, brethren and fathers, and you might say, well, Paul here is uh, violating what God says, either that, or you might think it's okay to call other people fathers. But Jesus isn't talking about fathers from the standpoint of fathers of our, what we call fathers of our country or fathers of our nation, but he's talking about the idea of fathers from a religious standpoint. If you call somebody father from a religious standpoint, that because if somebody's your father, I have a father, and I just went to go visit him, and, and I, I thank God that, that he's doing well for his age, uh, but he's my father. When he tells me to do something, I do it because he's my father. He's my physical father, but he's not my religious father. I don't call him father from a religious standpoint. Uh, if he asked me to do something that, I, that religiously I believe was wrong, uh, I wouldn't do it simply because he's my physical father. So Paul is using the word father here, uh, not from the standpoint of religious fathers, but fathers of the nation, th those leaders of the nation, those individuals who, who, who would lead the nation. And so I don't believe that Paul is, is violated what God said in not calling any man your father. Uh, I, I don't believe that's what's under consideration. So because I, I do believe I can call my physical father father and that I can call uh, George Washington the father of our country. Uh, but when it comes religiously, uh, George Washington and my father, my physical father, are not my fathers. My father, when, it, when we're talking religiously and spiritually, is God. Uh, and so uh, 
I want to just point that out to you here. So uh, brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offered to you. Now, Paul is giving his defense. The other thing I want you to notice is that sometimes Christians have the idea we can't defend ourselves. Well, we can defend ourselves. Paul's giving his defense here. Now, we're not to defend ourselves from the standpoint of harming or hurting other people, but we certainly can defend ourselves with speech and ideas because that's how uh, we defend ourselves. That's how we break down those uh, barriers that cause individuals not to be able to uh, serve, serve God. Uh, and in 2 Corinthians, I forgot which uh, Corinthian letter it was in, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is talking about this. He says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 2, I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I purpose to be courageous against some, but regard us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, warring according to the flesh would be beating people up. Defending yourself according to the flesh would be bombs, bullets, and guns. Okay? So he says, for though we walk in the flesh, in other words, we live in this physical world, we Christians do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. In other words, they're not guns, bullets, rocks, and stones. He says, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. He says the weapons we, we have really do destroy fortresses. Well, what kind of fortresses? Fortresses that people hide behind to keep from seeing God. Verse 5 says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, I want you to notice that. He says, we are destroying speculations. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. One of the big problems that's going on in our country today is that you can't say anything to anybody if they disagree with you because it might make them feel bad. And so therefore, when, when our government takes away our ability to speak, then they've taken our, they, can, they have taken away the Christian's ability to defend themselves. We don't defend ourselves with stones and rocks and bullets. We defend ourselves with the word of God. We defend ourselves with the sword. We defend ourselves with, with history and with the truth and with the prophets. And that's how we defend ourselves. But our, our country is telling us that you can't uh, disagree with people, especially if you're conservative. Uh, as, uh, and really, it's kind of funny that those who, who consider themselves liberal uh, are the ones who want to keep uh, individuals who have a difference of opinion from speaking and talking, uh, and so therefore they get all upset, and and that's what you see today in the riots and and the 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 uh, movements that are going on, uh, and I would suggest to you that's part of Satan keeping Christians from being able to defend themselves. Now, here's what I want you to understand: we should still defend ourselves. We should still speak what God says. We should still uphold what God says. If it, if it hurts somebody's feelings, we're sorry. Now, that doesn't mean we're to be rude and mean and disrespectful. But it also doesn't mean that we're supposed to uh, tuck our, our uh, tail between our legs and act like we can't speak up for Jesus. That's what Jesus was talking about when he says, if you don't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father in heaven. So Paul is going to give his defense. He is defending himself. Now, he's not taking revenge because the, the Bible teaches that vengeance belongs to God. And so God's going to take our vengeance for us. But we are to give our defense, uh, and we are to tell people what, why it is that we do what we do and why we believe what we believe, hoping that it will tear down speculations in their thinking that are keeping them from believing in God. One of the biggest ones today is evolution. So, some people hold to evolution. And so, and our schools... Uh, who, who, are, who are basically controlled by the uh, elite uh, education people who believe in evolution and therefore they're unwilling to allow any other idea to be propagated in schools, uh, try to control things. And so they, they won't let intelligent design be taught because they're trying to keep Christians from defending themselves. And what bothers me the most is some Christians think Therefore, they shouldn't say anything. So take a, take a message from Paul. He just got beat up, but he doesn't stop talking for Jesus. 
He's going to talk for Jesus, even though it makes them mad. But the first thing that he tries to do, and I want you to notice this, is he tries to get them to understand that they're brethren. He says, brothers, fathers. He says, I'm from your country. You know, Abraham is my father, and, and David is my father, and, and, and those individuals from the, from the, the nation of Israel, they're, they're, they're my father, they're my, my heritage, just like you. He's trying to get them to see the similarities so that when he speaks to them, they won't look at him as if, it, as if he's some foreigner who's speaking. So, verse 2 says, And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet, and he said, Now, I want to suggest something to you. Sometimes we spend a lot of money going off into foreign countries to preach the word. Now, I'm not talking about individuals who go to foreign countries in order to help them, you know, build like wells or, or dig wells or build houses for the poor or those kind of things where, where we can go in and our manpower is helpful. But I'm talking about where you have some guy go to some foreign country and he has to have an interpreter with him in order to, to, to speak. It might be a better idea for us to send somebody there who knows that, that language uh, and therefore be able to speak to them. And that's the reason why most of my missionary work uh, was done in Latin American countries because I can speak Spanish and I can speak English. Uh, but he spoke to them in their dialect. That's always, it's always better if you speak to somebody in their own dialect because it helps build familiarity. And so it says, and they became even more quiet. So they, so they listened to him. They said, oh, look, he knows Hebrew. He's like us. He's one of us. Let's listen to what he says. And he said, I am a Jew. So there you go. He, he's of the Jew. When he says he's a Jew, he's not necessarily talking about religiously, but he's talking about nationally because that's what he means by Jews. The Jewish community was from Israel, the, the, the Jewish nation and, and Judea. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you, as you all are today. And so again, he tries to appease the people by getting them to understand that they have similar situations and similar backgrounds. He says, I am a Jew. And no doubt he's speaking from the standpoint of uh, racially, he's a Jew. Then he says, but, he, but he's born in Tarsus of, of Cilicia. So, so he's, he's also from Cilicia. Uh, and then it says, but brought up in this city. So even though he's from Tarsus, they send him to, to Jerusalem. Now, uh, uh, what that means is that his parents were so concerned about his Jewish heritage that they wanted him educated in Jerusalem, the most Jewish city in the world. And so they sent him to Jerusalem. So why in the world would he be against the Jewish community if he is a Jew and if he was brought up there? Not only that, but it says educated under Gamaliel. Now, if you, if you remember, Gamaliel was the individual who, uh, uh, who uh, kind of came to the, to the defense of, um, uh, of Peter when he had been, been arrested and they wanted to kill him. Uh, and and uh, Gamaliel came and basically said to them that um, if you kill uh, Peter, you might be fighting against God, uh, and if the movement isn't from God, it's going to die out, uh, and so they basically beat Paul and John, I believe John was with them, uh, instead of killing them, and that's who Gamaliel was, but he was, he was, he was the most respected Jewish uh, ruler or rabbi that you can think of. Uh, usually, the um, Sadducees would have like their, their number one head guy that they would use for counsel. And then the Pharisees would have their number one head guy they would use for counsel. And usually they were two different individuals. But Gamaliel was so respected that both the Sadducees and the Pharisees uh, used him as their uh, information source or as their uh, 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 legal counsel, you might say. And so when he, Paul says he's brought up under Gamaliel, 
there was nobody more Jewish or who, understand the, who understood the law better than Gamaliel. And when Paul says, I brought up under him, he's speaking about the fact that he is not, not only, even though he was born a Jew, and even though he lived in Cilicia, he was sent to Jerusalem to be educated in, a, in the most Jewish city by the most Jewish educator they could find. And it was strictly according to the law of our fathers. Notice again, he says fathers. Uh, by fathers, he's talking about uh, the, 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 the Jewish community. He says, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. He says he was brought up and he was zealous for God. And when he says zealous for God, he means zealous for God according to the Old Testament. They were, they were zealous for God. People in the Old Testament were zealous for God. Uh, not all of them were, were hypocrites. Uh, many of them were, were, were very zealous for God. Matter of fact, Paul said, you want to know how, how zealous I was? Verse 4 says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. Uh, and, and so he says, how um, zealous was I? I did more than you guys did. You guys didn't persecute people. I did. I persecuted these Christians the way. And notice that it says he calls them the way. You see, there's really no particular name that has to be used for God's people. Whatever designation you want to give them that points to the fact that they belong to God is sufficient in the scriptures. The way refers to the way of salvation or the way of righteousness or the way of God. And Paul talks about them being the way. Um, and, and so it, it kind of bothers me when some individuals have the idea that, you know, you got to be in a church that's called by a certain name when the scriptures never teach any of that. Uh, you certainly don't want to attend a church that's the church of Satan, but there's nothing wrong with, with attending a church that, that, you know, has the name Christians meet here or saints meet here or, God, or God's people meet here or the church of Christ meets here or the, or the church of God meets here uh, or Christians gather here uh, or, or the way meets here, uh, all of those would be acceptable uh, because there, there is no particular individual way that God expects his people to be designated, but he does expect them all to act like Christians. So he says, I persecuted the way, this way, to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. So notice that Paul uh, was an equal opportunity uh, persecutor. He persecuted men and women equally. Um, and, and notice that uh, it doesn't mention children or, or infants. Uh, and I believe the reason for that is because, uh, number one, uh, if you could understand the gospel, you were probably considered a man or a woman. And, and so therefore, those people that were, had submitted to the, to the uh, rule of God uh, were adults and, and were, were men and women. But he, he would put them in prison. And so he was saying how he persecuted them. To, just to show them how zealous he was. He says, verse 5, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. For from them, I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. So Paul is saying, and if you ask the council, they can tell you that that's what I was doing because I got a letter from them. Now, our time is up, but I want to talk to you about that a little bit more next week. I'm glad that you came. Glad the Lord blessed you for being here. Pray that he helps you in all that you do uh, and that we stay faithful to him. And remember, speak up for Jesus. Don't let our culture, don't let our, our society dictate whether we can defend ourselves. God's people defend themselves by speaking the word of God and breaking down barriers and breaking down speculations that keep people from seeing God. Don't let your friends be blind. Help them see God. Speak up for him. Speak up for him. And pray that God blesses you in everything. Thanks for being here.